This is my 40th year in education. I have been a student of leadership, specifically servant leadership, for most of that time. My hope today is to simplify servant leadership by presenting you with a few key principles. For example, servant leadership is about who you are, not what you are. Servant leadership is a choice for each of us to make. And servant leadership can be found in ordinary, everyday interactions. Its power is in its simplicity. A few years back, I was the president of Eastside Catholic High School outside of Seattle in Bellevue, Washington. Our students were asked to do a set number of service hours every year. As sometimes happens towards the end of the school year in June, a number of sophomores were a few service hours short. One of our teachers gathered the students together and said, let's do a car wash. You might have driven by these scenes from time to time, enthusiastic teenagers, usually in bathing suits, waving signs, trying to get you to stop so they could wash your car, usually to raise funds for their soccer team or cheer squad or whatever. Well, this car wash was different. People would pull up and ask how much the car wash costs. Student reply, no charge, it's free. Then what's it for? We just want to wash your car. Why do you want to wash my car? We just do. It's our gift to you. Some people would pull out a $5 bill or a $10 bill and try to give it to the students. Students would politely decline. Some people became incredulous. Why are you doing this? Why are you treating a perfect stranger this way? This example fascinates me to this day. This small act of service caused, caused confusion among the people on the receiving end because we rarely experience it. However, there was so much power in that simple gesture. I firmly believe this power strikes at the core of servant leadership. In fact, that it was a simple act of selflessness. In fact, that selflessness is the first requirement of a servant leader. To be a servant leader, you must serve and expect nothing in return. Now, I know our students had an ulterior motive. They needed the hours. So it wasn't completely altruistic. But they could have found a reason to charge the people who stopped by but they chose not to. They were able to experience that feeling of pure giving. They simply said, here, accept this small gesture as our gift to you. What we're really talking about here is generosity. The key to being generous is that there is no quid pro quo. It starts as an act of selflessness. Generosity to me is the act of giving without any expectations. I had the experience of being on the receiving end of such generosity many years ago. My brother was a rookie teacher in Milwaukee, and my dad and I drove up to visit him on one of those miserably cold Wisconsin winter weekends. Sorry. We noticed in the paper that Marquette was playing the University of North Carolina in basketball. Now, basketball junkies know that these are two storied basketball programs. So, like three yokels, we ventured down to the arena in the bitter cold, sauntered up to the ticket counter, and asked for three tickets. The ticket person took a long, I don't want to sound like a jerk, pause, and finally said, this game has been sold out for six months. As the embarrassment began to sink in, a police officer happened by. He'd overheard our brief conversation. He said, you want to go to the game? Here, I just busted a scalper, and he handed us three tickets. <laughs> so. And as you expect, it was like getting the golden ticket in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Someone who had no obvious reason to do something nice for us had chosen to do just that. True generosity. 
the two examples I just shared with you, giving and receiving in their purest form, to me reinforce the power of selfless servant leadership. I know there have been times in my life when I haven't responded as generously as that policeman or those high school students. Of course, the flip side sends a message too. Fred Hargadon, my boss in the Princeton admission office, came in one morning kind of shaking his head. He said someone, had cut him, someone thought he'd cut him off. So the guy laid on the horn, dramatically pulled to the left, and as he was passing Fred, gave him the finger. And as the guy sped off, Fred noticed a little rectangular bumper sticker on the back of the guy's car that read, practice random acts of kindness. <laughs> to be clear, I'm not asking you to give up your job. I'm not saying you need to start offering your product for free to be a leader. I am advocating that when you have a chance to help someone, you do so without conditions. What is the cost of that kindness? It's free, isn't it? Too often we think consciously or subconsciously, what's in it for me? I'm asking you to suspend your own wishes and needs and focus solely on serving others, as I said, without expecting anything in return. We all realize how hard that can be. Still, you will find it liberating. You see, while some people might view leadership in terms of power or ego or charisma, I believe we are all here to make a difference by leaving this world better than we found it. We make a difference when we check our ego and ask, how can I help? How can I best serve? So it really does come down to what kind of a leader you want to be. Remember, leadership isn't inherently good or bad. The history of the world is littered with evil leaders. At St. Edward High School, because we believe creating servant leaders is our mission, we developed an optional servant leadership retreat for our high school students almost a decade ago. I often give the opening reflection, which is a visualization exercise. And I want to ask you to do what I ask our students to do. Close your eyes. Seriously, close your eyes. And picture a leader you admire. Could be living or dead, well-known, someone you know. Everyone have someone in mind. OK, keep your eyes closed. Now, I'd like you to think of a quality or characteristic of that leader that you think is essential to his or her effectiveness as a leader. OK, hold on to that word or those words. You can open your eyes. In 60 seconds, tell me what you have. Generosity. Generosity. Pardon me? Listen. Good listener. Good Kindness. Pardon me? Fearless. I'm sorry. Integrity. Integrity. Humble. Humble. Okay. I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm getting too many things at once, but courageous. courageous. Okay, lots of interesting words. We get a lot over the years. Well, listen, the let's start. That's a good start. So, here are some words we've heard over the years. Invariably. What you see when we examine the list is the words break down into two categories that are shown here, character or skill. Let's think about character. Leadership has everything to do with character. Leadership has been defined as character in action, and character defines who you are. One thing I want you to take away from this talk is that leadership is who you are, not what you are. Let me repeat that. Leadership is who you are, not what you are. We can choose our character. Just look at that list of traits. Anyone can work on and develop your character. Aside from character traits, the rest are skills. And the great thing about skills is they can be learned. 
A skill is defined as the ability to do something that comes from training, experience, or practice. You will get better with more practice, more training, and more experience. Anyone can work on this aspect of who you are. I know many people don't see themselves as leaders. However, I submit anyone can choose to be a servant leadership, a leader. Think back to that police officer at the basketball game. Here is more good news. There are no prerequisites. Do you need an MBA? Do you need to pass a leadership bar exam? Do you have to be over six feet tall? Do you have to be a man? Do you have to have a certain income? Do you have to be elected? The answer to all these questions is no. Becoming a servant leader is a choice. It is simply making the decision, literally taking the first step to become a servant leader. It is me saying and you saying, I choose to be a servant leader. That's it. As Albert Schweitzer famously said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I know, the only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. James C. Hunter wrote the best book I have ever read on servant leadership called The World's Greatest Leadership Principle, How to Become a Servant Leader. And one of my favorite parts of the book is he realized if he took the popular passage from 1 Corinthians, often called the wedding passage, you've probably heard of it, love is patient, love is kind, etc. When he substituted the word leadership for love, the passage still worked. Leadership is patient. Leadership is kind. Leadership is not jealous. Leadership is not pompous. Leadership is not inflated. Leadership is not rude, nor does it seek its own interests. Leadership is not quick-tempered. Leadership does not brood over injury. Leadership does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Leadership bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. What I most like about this example is it equates leadership and love. And I believe that servant leadership is an act of love. There's a Greek word for a certain kind of love called agape. Its origins are in God's love for mankind. Now, there are several forms of love. There's parental love between a parent and a child. Filial love between a child and a parent. Love between siblings. Platonic love among friends. Romantic love that makes your heart flutter. To me, agape love simply means this. I love because I can. I lead because I can. And I love and lead expecting nothing in return. That's not to say there aren't other virtuous qualities. Being smart is great. Being driven is important. And being successful is interesting. However, I ask you this important question. To what end? Servant leadership is influencing others. And think about it. Our lives are really defined by our relationships, aren't they? Can we agree that being a positive influence on others is a good use of our time and talent? Instead of accumulating things, we can accumulate relationships. As a priest friend once said, have you ever seen a U-Haul in a funeral procession? The point is, Let's focus on what truly matters. In that vein, let's take servant leadership one step farther. One phrase I use constantly with my colleagues at St. Edward is, first we model. People are watching. They observe what kind of leaders we are. So what does that mean? Well, I used to go to an executive coach, Chris Monnofsinger in Seattle. Chris Mann wrote a short book called From One to Many, and in that book he made several interesting points on leadership, the shift from one to many. Let me explain. First, we succeed early in our careers because we outperform. 
We get noticed for what we do. We receive accolades for our work. We get promoted. As you assume more of a leadership role, however, you build a team of people who share your values and desire, but you begin to give up your power as you model for them. Your team members become the high performers as you support and celebrate them. When we are fully developed as leaders, our time is vested in our team success, which makes complete sense because five or 10 or 20 people can accomplish so much more than any individual can accomplish. We lead others by investing in their success. In fact, a true servant leader invests 100% of his or her time in the success of others. When you're giving credit to those around you, people might start to look at you and wonder, so what do you do? And one of the great takeaways for me for the, from this book for me was this. If you are a person driven by your ego, you won't be able to give up that power or the accolades and find joy in others' success. As I tell everyone in our organization, check your ego at the door. No one gets extra credit for being right. Together, we have to be right. The additional reward of being a servant leader is that when we serve others, they in turn serve the next person. Pause and imagine what your organization could look like. If you model servant leadership by being invested in those around you, you will do great work and you will create other servant leaders. I like the image of dropping a rock into a pond. You see the ripples slowly spread out in every direction as your influence will spread far and wide to make this world a better place. Now that is a great legacy. Throughout my years, throughout all my experiences, I keep coming back to servant leadership as the greatest calling. I firmly believe that making the choice to be a servant leader is the best decision you will ever make. Servant leadership is a selfless act. Servant leadership is an act of love. Servant, I serve others expecting nothing in return. I love and serve because I can. Servant leadership is contagious. It will spread to those you influence and to the people they influence. There are no prerequisites other than being a person of character with a willingness to develop your skills. You can leave this moment empowered by this truth. Servant leadership is a choice. You just have to decide. And if you do, I know you can be the leader others look to, the leader your world, and quite honestly, our world needs. It is the best decision any one of us can make in order to live lives of positive purpose. Thank you.